Hello from the Royal International Air Tattoo, otherwise known as RIAT, one of the largest gatherings of military aircraft in Europe. It's a fantastic show. It's probably the hottest day of the year the UK's had so far in 2024, and there are some really interesting aircraft here. Today, we're going to have a look at some of the less obvious choices of aircraft. We're not going to be looking at fast jets. We're not going to be looking at big jets. We're going to be looking at some of the smaller and more unique aircraft and some of the tasks that they perform. up with our content on YouTube, you might recognize this airplane behind me. This is the Airbus A330 MRTT, and just a few weeks ago, we were in Getafe in Madrid, exploring how these aircraft are built or converted from passenger aircraft. Probably the most unique feature of the BA 146 301, which we find ourselves on, is this. Now, this is atmospheric measuring equipment. It measures all the key stuff that meteorologists need. Think temperature, pressure, all that kind of stuff. But the most interesting part is how it's put into the atmosphere. This is ejected from the aircraft whilst the aircraft is pressurized using this tube. Think of it as a kind of upside down torpedo tube. So equipment goes in, seal it up, fire it out, drops out the bottom of the aircraft. Amazing stuff. This isn't any British Aerospace 146. This is the first British Aerospace 146 to take to the air, the first one to actually fly. So it's technically a 100 series that's been upgraded to what is now called the 301. And essentially that's involved re-engineering the aircraft, stretching it to the length of a 300, and including quite a lot of funky stuff in the cabin. So tell me a little bit about what it's like uh, to fly the 146. It's uh, a nice aeroplane to fly. It's very robust, it's very stable. It's got four engines, which is nice. We get to fly a lot of uh, interesting and sort of challenging type stuff down at low level, uh, different parts of the world. So it's great fun. It's very enjoyable. And it's um, probably the best flying I've had outside the military in terms of challenging and interesting things to do and nice places to be. And what, uh, you talk about low flying, how does, how does that actually look? Like, what do those kind of missions look like? Um, well, we're clear down to 50 feet uh, momentarily and 100 feet sustained. <laughs> and uh, what is it about the 146 that makes it so well suited for that kind of mission? Uh, four engines helps. Uh, it's a very robust aircraft built in an era when things were probably over-engineered for what they were required to do. Um, it's got good short field capability um, and it's stable. It's nice to handle uh, at low level. It's got a good safety record and it's um, and it's reliable and it's very stable at low level, which is nice. Four or five hours of level with this, you, you, you know you've been flying it. It's, uh, it's, it takes some sort of yeah. moving around. It doesn't, yeah. It's not a light aircraft to fly. We're a unique four-engine aircraft. It's our job to learn about the weather by flying through the weather. So we've got a fit of scientific instrumentation mounted on the outside of the aircraft and in the cabin that lets us measure lots of different parameters about the weather and atmosphere to help us uh, with universities and the Met Office with understanding weather systems and climate change. So there's a lot of history with this airframe. The aircraft was originally the prototype 146-100, the first aircraft that ever flew with that program. It then became the prototype 300 after it was extended. Then around the year 2000, in fact, we bought it in 2001, when this facility was being started. We were looking for a new aircraft. A Hercules had been operated by the meteorological research flight of the Royal Air Force up until then. That facility was becoming too expensive, really, for the customers, the university customers, to afford. So we wanted something that was smaller, cheaper to operate, but still gave us the capabilities that we needed. So a pressurized aircraft with enough cabin space for our instrumentation, enough range and endurance, and the ability to be modified with all the scientific equipment we needed on the outside and inside. We fly a huge range of different missions for lots of different university and research customers. So we can reconfigure the aircraft for each scientific mission. And they can be anything from um, looking at the monsoon season in India through to studying uh, pollutants around the city of Birmingham and everything in between. So we're a pressurized aircraft. 
um, which is good in some ways. It's great for passenger comfort. We can put instruments on the inside that um, are okay to look through a glass panel. But if we need to mount instruments directly outside, looking directly into the air, then they need to be mounted outside the pressure hull of the aircraft. So what was added during the conversion is what we call the large radiometer blister. So three big instrument bays, unpressurized, that have replaceable panels on the outside, and we can then fit different scientific instruments inside those bays to directly look at above and below the aircraft. So one of the most recognizable features of this aircraft from the outside that differentiates it from a standard airliner are our two cloud physics pylons. So each wing, each pylon has the ability to mount up to five different instruments on there. What they're used for is if we need to image anything to do with clouds directly. So some things can't be drawn into the cabin to be tested and analyzed, things like complex ice crystals, uh, water content of clouds, some things that like the science, the data would be lost as it pulled in. So we need to image that directly, undisturbed in the airflow around the plane. So for example, on here, we've got an instrument that can look at different ice crystals as we fly along. So in real time, we're imaging uh, snowflakes, crystals in the air. We're getting those pictures relayed onto screens in the cabin so that we can understand what's making up those clouds. We can understand uh, different particulate pollution and aerosol in the atmosphere with a top instrument in real time. And this instrument teaches us about turbulence. So it's a heated turbulence probe. So we get data on how the air masses are moving as we fly through them. I'm the Flight uh, Operations Manager with the British Antarctic Survey based in Cambridge and uh, it's my job to uh, firstly organise the ferry flights, so getting the aircraft from Canada to Antarctica and back every year and then a lot of the science that the aircraft do uh, is also my job to organise and coordinate that. And I'm based in Cambridge and I've been in the role for about uh, six years now. It's quite a lengthy process, we've got a fairly well planned and trodden route that we do each time but it does vary a little bit from year to year so the route at the moment is about 12 days flying 55 hours give or take and uh, for the southbound route the aircraft will fly from uh, Calgary and then make three stops through the United States across the Gulf of Mexico uh, to um, uh, to Cancun area and then from there down to Panama, uh, Panama down to Peru, and then there's four stops making uh, the aircraft way down through the spine of Chile, and then the final leg is from uh, Punta Arenas in southern Chile to Antarctica. So it's quite a long, it's quite a long trip. It does vary a little bit from year to year because of quite often it's kind of political and other stability issues. So depending on what's happening in a country. For example, we may have been going to a certain country for quite a few years, something happens there and it's deemed not safe to go, so then we'll go somewhere else. So it follows a similar line down through the Americas, but over the years there's lots of places that we've gone uh, that maybe we don't visit anymore and I'm sure that will continue to change. Um, yeah, so it's quite a varied and interesting route. So a couple of years ago one of the aircrafts in North Dakota and it was about minus 41 I think. It's far colder than anything that they'd normally experienced during their Antarctic flying and then you know by the time you get to Mexico and uh, Ecuador Panama it's 30 to 40 degrees maybe 90 plus percent humidity really horribly uncomfortable sweating before you've even <laughs> taxied out so it varies quite a bit it can be jackets on to start with then into short sleeves and then depending on the temperatures in North America then you can be back into jackets again it varies from, from ferry to ferry really yeah so the British Antarctic Survey is the UK's kind of presence in Antarctica essentially um, and we operate a number of research stations uh, in Antarctica. Our main one is Rothera Research Base and uh, Rothera is open throughout the year. So this time of year, we obviously summer here, but that's uh, winter time in Antarctica. There will be somewhere between 20 and 40 people on station, so it's kept active, but um, of course it's very cold, very dark, and then once we get into our 
autumn, we're coming into then the Antarctic spring. So then our season is all kind of gearing up. So that's when it goes from essentially the winter quiet time into the summer busy time. And it can peak at, I think someone told me recently that it was getting up towards 200 people will be on station. It's quite interesting kind of describing because I've seen it myself. But some of the people I've spoken to today is fascinating because I almost had the impression that they thought that our presence in Antarctica was fixing aeroplanes out on the ice. There's some huts and, you know, that's kind of really it. But the Rothera base is actually a, a remarkable place. So we've got a gravel runway um, that we fly this aircraft and the Dash 7s from. And indeed visiting aircraft use it as well. But have full maintenance facilities and hangars. Um, but then there are the things that you would expect essentially if you had a imagined a tiny town that could accommodate up to 200 people you would have a canteen a library a games room you know uh, chill and rest out areas pool tables um, a gym uh, right the way through to all the accommodation people's working spaces loads of storage areas places where waste is processed kitchens yards and um, buildings where we keep boats and uh, mechanical equipment so it, there really is a wide range of, of people and a lot of things happening there it's uh, yeah and it, it's a really fascinating place to, to spend some time so this is um twinota victor papa foxtrot alpha zulu which uh, as you can see is called ice cold katie uh, it's the only one of our airplanes that carries a, a permanent name. Uh, we operate four Twin Otters. Uh, two of them can be configured for science. So this one, uh, Fox Alpha Zulu, we will often use for atmospheric science, and that's the configuration that you see it in here at React. Fox Bravo Lima is more commonly used for geophysical science. So for example, you could put equipment on it where there are radars that can penetrate down through the ice. And then the two other Twin Otters, Fox Bravo Bravo and Fox Bravo Charlie, they're standard Twin Otters that are used primarily for moving people and equipment around Antarctica. So that could be, for example, taking fuel drums and a skidoo and tents and uh, you know a small team of people out to a field location to drop them off to do some surveying for a week. Or it could be supporting a major multinational collaboration where there's aircraft and people that have been um, yeah, come from loads of different countries and the, those projects sometimes go on over multiple seasons. So it really varies. But the aircraft are incredibly good at this kind of work. I guess that's why you see Twin Otters in all the remote, uh, remote parts of the world. But we operate them on wheel skis in Antarctica. So we fly them down on on wheels and then we install the wheel skis in Antarctica because our runway at Rothera is a gravel runway so the aircraft operate as you would see it now with the skis but in the raised position but then after takeoff the skis are lowered and then the aircraft can essentially land well wherever people need us to, to land um, but it gives us the versatility and then at the end of the season the uh, skis are removed and then the aircraft will fly back to Canada um, yeah just in their sort of standard uh, wheel configuration. So this is one of the cloud probes that we fly with. Uh, it's got a number of different uh, instruments on there. So first of all, uh, we've got this tube here. Uh, the air will flow, flow through this. Uh, and inside the air are very small particles, which we call aerosol. And aerosol are actually uh, very important ingredients for clouds to form on. So they act as a cloud condensation nucleus. So water droplets can form on there. Or they can act as an ice nucleating particle where ice crystals can form on. This here measures the uh, size distribution of all of these particles that can act as a cloud forming nucleus in, in the atmosphere. Then we've got uh, this probe sticking out right here that measures airspeed basically. And then we've got these two here. Um, here also the um, different particles will flow through but actually it's an imager so what we're particularly interested in is the size of crystals and um, the shape of different crystals that are inside the clouds. Hello, my name is Rob Harrison. I'm the head of the National Flying Laboratory Centre and one of the aircraft that we fly is the one that's behind us, converted Saab 340 airliner. We use the aircraft as a flying classroom for undergraduate students both at Cranfield and across the country. We also do research work with it and we're utilising the aircraft as a STEM outreach tool with our SATCOM system. The aircraft that preceded it was the Jetstream 31, a 19-seat turboprop aircraft. Um, it was coming to the end of its useful time and we needed to find a replacement. Cranfield and Saab have a, a strategic uh, agreement with each other. We were looking for a new aircraft and Saab said, we think we've got one in the hangar that might interest you. Um, for us, 
A turboprop is great for a flying classroom because not just the aerodynamics of a normal aircraft, but the propellers make it more complicated. And when you're trying to demonstrate things to students, it just really helps to, to show them that added complication. So one of the exercises we do with the students is we demonstrate something called a fugoid. And what we do with the aircraft is, is we set it up in straight and level flights with no autopilot, all in trim. And then the pilots will raise the nose nice and high and then just let go. And then we see what happens. Now if the aircraft is designed properly and the weight is in the right place, the aircraft will describe a roller coaster in the sky. And eventually the roller coaster will dampen out and the aircraft will return back to level flight all on its own. If, however, the aircraft is not built properly or the weight is in the wrong place, then that roller coaster can get bigger and bigger until finally the pilots have to knock it off and take control. For the students, it's fantastic because they are in the aeroplane, they feel the aircraft going up and down, they can see the displays in front of them, they can see the world outside changing. So it's a fully immersive experience for them. And it's not something that can be replicated in a simulator, flying a drone, that sort of thing. So for us, we think it's a really essential part of a student's education to feel this thing for real.